because in this episode, we're going to have a dancer, a choreographer, an educator of the arts. And I just need to make sure I kind of know what it tastes like to kind of be dancing. But even though I'm not a dancer, I think we're gonna have a great chat. Let's first find out who our guest is today. What's up, IFO Nightly Show? My name is Alexander Tu, also known as Dr. Alexander Tu. I am a co-founder of the Performing Arts Program at Seoul Music Performing Arts Academy and the founder of Lyricist Dance Company. Uh, and today on IFO Nightly Show, I will be sharing my experience in dance uh, education and my experience as a student in the university level. Uh, and tonight, I'll see you guys very soon on IFO Nightly Show. See ya. IFO audience, I'm back! You haven't seen me this season, but uh, in this episode, you're going to be able to see me. And you've just seen the clip of our lovely guest. I'm Alexander Du. Welcome to the show. Hey, Phoebe. Hello, IFO Nightly Show. Thank you for having me. Well, we're going to start our conversations, and we have a lot of great things to talk about today. Um, three sections in the talk today. And I'd like to start off, you know, really, I think, straight to the point as to what a lot of people care about. You know, <laughs> how did your journey to the art start? And I have a couple of follow-up questions after that. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, my journey started, um, so in the world of dance, um, if ballet is the foundation of most dance, then I started very late. In ballet, you started like three, four uh, years old. I started when I was 12. And uh, I started because of my brother. He introduced to me um, the first hip-hop dance, which is called break dancing. Actually, it was a few steps in like house dance. But then that just, just transcended to what's called breakdancing or b-boying. And then from there, throughout uh, junior high, high school, I was just engulfing myself in that. And then uh, in the university, my friend wanted to, to join an audition uh, for this group. And um, we auditioned. Unfortunately, my friend didn't make it, but I was chosen to join. And um, that's how it started. I, I, so essentially from that group, I learned about you know, choreography style dancing, um, and then bringing uh, all the different elements of like hip hop into the choreography kind of style. Um, and then from there, it just kind of continued uh, until now, yeah. Mm. For the audience that don't yet know, uh, can you maybe just help to elaborate a little bit? Why is ballet the, the fundamental, the foundation, and what is choreography dancing? Yeah, okay, so ballet, uh, probably ballet is probably one of the very first genre of dance. And the reason why I call it the, like the foundation of dance is because um, it's very technical, uh, and ballet kind of from there like transcended a lot of different other types of dance. You know, then you progress from ballet to then you have like neoclassic to then like people wanted to break out of that mold and like created like jazz or contemporary dance. Uh, so those all that that theater type dance came from ballet in the realm of hip hop. Uh, so in hip hop, you have four elements, right? And when hip hop first was created, it was mainly because people wanted to have a voice, and then you wanted to use uh, different elements to express their their thoughts, their opinions, um, and a way to kind of move a community together to kind of uh, raise awareness uh, for any societal issues. Breakdancing came about, and breakdancing and all the other street elements was because it's you know the the individual is trying to use that form to express himself. Uh, to make a point, to prove a point. 
uh, and to use dance as a voice. Then people started wanting to, groups started wanting to dance synchronized. And then so now you're having what's called choreography dancing. Um, and then that's, that's where that, that grew. And choreography dancing really um, came out of Southern California. Uh, it grew in popularity. And from there, a lot of the guys that I was growing up with in that community are now like choreographers for um, like major singers or even like um, BTS, uh, Korean, like what we call K-pop. Uh, yeah, a lot of the choreographers during that time are now choreographers for a lot of groups around the world. So really honored and proud to come from that community uh, and, and for me in that generation to still be doing it at this age. Mm -hmm. Now, you started out in the US. You've had a number of experiences right, before you came back to Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, when did you first think that Vietnam is you know, your next landing place and, and a good one? Uh, actually, growing up, never. Um, so, so I was born and raised in, in the States, and my closest connection to Vietnam was my parents. You know, everything about Vietnam you learn at home. So the only time I get Vietnamese culture was in the home. Um, but then as you grow up, you know, go through high school, undergrad, the, the time that you spent at home and the time I communicated with my parents was less and less and less and less. So I never thought I was going to ever come, I was ever going to live in Vietnam. Um, I have an older brother who, after his master's, came back to Vietnam and, you know, um, developed his, his, his art and his artistry. And he, uh, one of Hong Kong Pass' first music video was My Apologies. And he invited me onto that project. Hong Kong Pai was agreeable to me choreographing for her. Um, and so, yeah, and then at, after that year, I decided, let's, let's, take, let's take time off. I've already been working in the, industry, the health industry for some time. I felt like I was already understanding it. Um, I felt comfortable in it. And I think that comfortable, that feeling of being comfortable didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then I decided, let's take time off. Let's go back to Vietnam. When I went back to Vietnam, um, I had a chance to work with Hoang Thu Linh, um, and then I had a chance to do, um, be a choreographer for a stage show called Jun Zang Việt Nam. And then Hop Miet Ngo Sao is a reality television show, uh, approached me, asked me to be a judge on the show and to be a performance coach. And then at the same time, uh, my good friend and my good buddy here in Vietnam, uh, Thay Thanh Boi, uh, had a school called Soul Music, Academy, Tan invited me to partner with him to develop the dance side. Uh, and so those things all kind of just helped me make the decision to live in Vietnam. It was the best time to, best time to do it. Uh, I had nothing to lose. I was not afraid. I was excited for it. And I was excited for the journey ahead because it's going to be very different. You know, living in Vietnam, it's a, it's a different culture. Uh, even though I'm Vietnamese, Vietnamese American, but it's a, it's a culture and I had to learn and engulf myself in it. And so, yeah, it's just exciting to, to say yes to deciding to live in Vietnam. Mm. Now, you created something here called The Lyricist. Yeah. And The Lyricist is, is a name that I find to be very poetic. Um, it's also very Western in a way. So why The Lyricist? And, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, um, so being back in Vietnam, one thing that I learned was, you know, the, the Arts in general, but dance was very, is seen in a different way. And it's seen very, how do I say this nicely? It's just seen like very like the bottom of the bottom of all the arts. Mm. And so, and then at the same time, understanding the industry and how the industry works, then we have, you know, I'm not saying, trying to say anything bad about any system out there, but you know, there are people that have to make a living. And so, hot by Jai show, but when you, show sometimes the quality of your movement, the quality of the artistry is, is diminished because how are you supposed to be able to perform for 10 different artists or four different artists at nighttime and try to remember all the different choreographies that you have to do. And so sometimes that, that is portrayed as like, oh, you know, the backup dancer, they're just hot nha mm. You know, that, that word is like um, something that I want to like change. Lyricist means someone that makes lyrics, that creates words to a song. And I wanted people to understand that when we create uh, our, our artistry, it's really about um, portraying how the words are used. Uh, so our movements um, require like thought process. There's thinking behind the movement that we're creating for that word. And you brought the lyricists to the world, you know, to Singapore, 
to the UK? And in a way, you know, is it being brought out to the world as, as a Vietnamese brand, or how is it being brought out to the world? Um, so, uh, and so, yeah, luckily for us, so Lyricist, um, we've had a chance to, so we, we entered a competition in Singapore. Uh, we won this um, dance competition called Super 24. We're the first Vietnamese group to do so, and very excited. And then under Lyricist, we have a junior team. So they're basically from high school, um, from 12, 13 to 17. And they are called Young Lyricists. And they were invited, they were chosen out of however many teams. And they're the first team from Asia, but the very first team from Vietnam to join a show, a big dance event in London called um, Dance Proms. And it was, it was organized at Royal Albert Hall, which is a, an amazing, amazing theater. And I'm, I'm partly jealous, but not, because I've always wanted to perform at that theater. But my students had a chance to perform on there, so I'm so proud. They performed on that stage wearing ao yai to nhạc của Trần Tín. Trần Tín, yeah. And so, um, Sekmo is the name of the song. And so like, you know, the crowd is all European. You know, we're the only Asian group. And so, you know, to be able to utilize like modern style choreography with nhạc của người Việt mình, like Vietnamese music, uh, with ao yai on this amazing stage, like, you know, that, that moment, like, you see everyone's focusing on our, like, 12 students. It was so, so amazing. So, uh, yeah, my idea was, you know, whatever I get to learn, I want to be able to share it with my students and my team, and then for them to be able to bring it out to the world if we have the opportunity to. <laughs> Guys, we're going to continue on to talk number two, where we're going to talk about Alex's journey in Vietnam and how he's building and raising his way to teach the arts and dance uh, to the whole Vietnamese population. But first, we're going to go to IFO on the go. So enjoy IFO on the go, and we'll be right back. Next on IFO Nightly Show. Hello, everybody. I'm currently a fourth year student at Hanoi Architectural University. I'm here and I am back on the go. Last time when we were in Ho Chi Minh City, we visited University of Medicines and Pharmacy, which is one that is focused very, very much on sciences. Um, today, I am in Hanoi, if you could already tell from my outerwear and from the background. Um, and we're going to visit a university that is very much on the other side of the spectrum, that is focused in arts and designs. Yes, today we're going to visit Hanoi Architectural University, one that was built in 1969. The school has a lot of histories and also a lot of myths. So today, let's go and debunk all of those myths, right? Shall we? With us today, we have a student, um, a tour guide, I might say. Kang, do you want to introduce yourself to the camera? Hello, everybody. I'm currently a fourth year student at Hanoi Architectural University. So without further ado, let's take us around the university. What is our first stop? Uh, right this here. Stop. Right here, right now. Uh, this is called Bo Sua Building. Bo Sua? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very cute, right? Let's go. It's like a, sort of an exhibition in here, a showcase almost. Uh, yes, this is the place where students can show their projects and their works for, uh, during their school works mm -hmm. and uh, open an art gallery here. Oh, it's sort of like an art gallery, so we do see um, 
graphic design. Yes. We see um, fashion design right here. <laughs> yes. What other kind of majors do we have in the school? Mm, we have many faculties uh, related to art, like mm -hmm. architecture, urban design, interior design, fashion design. Uh, you can see everything <laughs> around here. Um, these faculties are perfect for those who has abilities and uh, passion, mm -hmm. <laughs> abilities and fashions for arts, for um, compositions, colors, shape, size, and uh, geometry. This right here looks um, quite conceptual to me, I might say. <laughs> yes. Would you say that the students have to be very, very good in arts in order to get into the school? Uh, at first, um, perhaps they need a little bit of uh, the abilities for arts, mm -hmm. uh, eyes for the beauty, mm -hmm. but then uh, when you get into the school, mm -hmm. our teachers gonna train you better mm -hmm. and better, and mm -hmm. they have to train on their own also to improve their skill. But then you do also have to take um, like a drawing exam in order to get in here, right? Uh, yes. These uh, fashion designs are very, very cool. I've heard that students here dress up very fancy when they go to school. It's almost like a fashion show every day. Uh, yes, of course, because each student has their own unique personalities mm -hmm. and their artistic self, so they uh, choose to show it through mm -hmm. the choices of clothing and how they decorate themselves. Mm -hmm. So other students from other universities uh, have the impression that our students are like in the fashion show when they first arrived. <laughs> yes, um, I do think you dress also very cute today in, in your vibrant uh, pink color. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so right now we'll go and explore other buildings in the University of Architecture in Hanoi. But right before that, we'll be back to studio. Ta đều sinh ra với những số phận khác nhau, những cánh em muốn vươn mình trước trời gió đầy khát khao. Và chẳng cần cậu phải nói một lời nào, mình vẫn cảm nhận được một trái tim đầy hoài bão háo hức và nôn nao. IFO audience, welcome back. Did you enjoy IFO on the go? Well, you're going to enjoy this second talk because we're going to talk about art education in Vietnam. We're going to address a number of questions in which you might be afraid to ask. So I'm going to ask Alex for you. Well, <laughs> I hope I can answer it. Now, um, Alex, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, in the past, you know, in our culture, there's gum ki thi hoa. You know, the arts was like intrinsic of education in the past. But now it, it appears like people, people are afraid of the arts, people don't know much about it, people don't prioritize it, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's the case and, and how can we fix it? <laughs> yeah, um, good, good question. I think one of the reasons why people aren't into the arts is I, I feel like, you know, if we're talking about socio or economically, you know, sometimes you just have to work to make money so that you can have the bare necessities. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why art is kind of left left off the table because sometimes um, to be able to go through the journey of learning the arts, it takes some time. You know, sometimes you don't have that time to make, to make money, right? And so I think that's probably one of the reasons why art is kind of just left off, you know, like forgotten. Um, you know, our community, the arts, I think the past seven years, it is growing, which is amazing to see. And I think also it's grown because economically, Vietnam is doing better. Uh, so that's the wonderful to be a part of. I know that there's a lot of people before me coming back to Vietnam or people living here that has helped kind of like build the art. Um, I, I just want to be a part of that and help them push it and push it to, into the light so that people can see that art is not just you have to learn arts to become and then to like make money. You know, the art is not about making money, you know. And so that's, that's my message and the, reasons why, the reason why I de developed the academy or part of the academy and the dance company. Um, I want people to understand that art is, you know, it helps you build you and yourself or it helps you build your, chi your, your child can develop in a well-rounded way. Question for you. Now, when we think about 
the arts and, and maybe the, the art form of dance, right? A lot of people feel like, oh, if they don't see talent in the person, um, yeah. then they're not going to invest in the arts for, for that kid or yeah. you know, that young person. What is it called? Nung Kyu. Nung Kyu. Um, and I'm sure you've been asked a lot by, by parents, let's say you, when you do work with them, right? Yeah. What, what's your take on this? Um, personally, I, I think that's a bit of a, that's, that's not the best way to think about it, <laughs> <is> it? <laughs> Right, yes. Um, I, I think as a father and as an educator, I think um, if I can give an advice to parents is, you know, give the child an opportunity, you know, whether they show it or not, right? Because the more you um, offer them opportunities to explore different art forms uh, and specifically dance, then that's the only way we can see if they have it or not. You know, we can't expect that when you turn on YouTube and music and then that they're going to dance right away. Sometimes you have to facilitate it. You know, sometimes you have to you can kind of like plant the seed, right? If you feel like dance is something that it can be a value uh, to the growth of your child, then yeah, you've got to slowly start building it and plant that seed. You can't just expect, oh, you show me that you have some potential, then I'm going to then... Um, put you into classes. I think, you know, because you'll never know. Uh, and as parents, you kind of have to lead the way, you have to guide. And so for me, I would kind of offer them a chance to try it, you know, do it. Let them like see how, you know, take some time and let us see if it, it does grow in the person. Then you can feel if they have an key or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because not everyone comes out like, you know, Kobe Bryant didn't come out yeah. as a child and then uh, as a baby and he's making baskets, right? <laughs> it took time to grow. Um, you know, Michael Phelps, he didn't, at two, he wasn't like a swimmer yet. You know, the parents gave him that platform. They tried it. He grew and loved it, you know? So I think the same concept is here is that you have to kind of facilitate it. You give them that chance and then you see if the Nankyu comes or not, you know? Um, so hopefully parents can understand that, you know, whatever, anything good takes time, you know? Um, don't, don't, don't eliminate that chance for your child. Uh, just because they say like, you know, they're, you know, that quote, like they're dancing with two left feet, like give them the chance. That's wonderful. And, you know, I see you being an educator, you know, a, an artist, um, a businessman, and all these three elements seem to be in conflict with each other. You know, like an artist, it's kind of like formless, as you said. <laughs> you know, yeah. an educator, you know, needs some kind of structure. Yes. And then a businessman, you know, is... Um, numbers, 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 yeah. right. So can you make sense of this for me, please? Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for your question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I became a therapist so that I don't have to deal with numbers. <laughs> right, the only numbers I have to really worry about is like, you know, like angles of the joints. Um, and then as an artist, you don't have to worry about numbers besides five, six, seven, eight, you know, when you count, you know, your, your beats. Um, how this all ha I think um, I, I've been lucky. I've had the opportunity to even enter entrepreneurship. Uh, so as an, as a, in school, I was heading towards, you know, the medical field to get my degrees, to, you know, really make my parents happy. Um, but I also knew that having the medical field um, would, I can help people um, through their health. And the arts was to help people through the arts. Um, and so that was like basically the two passions that were going hand in hand. Coming back to Vietnam, I had the opportunity to develop a business. And I have to say a lot of it like that I learned is from Tay Tan. Um, you know, he was here previously and his background, his educational background, uh, he, you know, share, show, showing me the ropes. And then like, yeah, the businessman is very, you know, you gotta, you can't be an artist and think freely. Mm -hmm. You know, businessman, you gotta think numbers. You gotta think how you develop the business. What are your financial projections? You, yeah, I mean, you know all that. Uh, how do you develop your staff? How do you develop your teachers? Um, what are your KPIs? What are your marketing plans? So I think for me, uh, so yeah, all three elements are very different, very different. I think what I just keep true to myself is just keep growing uh, and just stay positive and, you know, because everywhere there's issues, you know, like even if you don't hit like your numbers, um, your financial productions, hey, okay, let's figure out a solution. Uh, and if you can just look at things like that and from a positive standpoint, then you succeed. Wonderful. And Alex, yes. we're still going to continue with this talk. <laughs> no. And then we talked about the present. You know, we're going to go back into the past. 
But guys, before we go into the past uh, to find out Alex's childhood story, we're going to continue to the IFO Challenge. IFO Challenge coming right up next. Join us. IFO audience, welcome to IFO Challenge, where we're going to play a game. You've seen this game in some other form before, but basically we're going to have to listen to a song, try to replicate the song using our vocal cords, and the other person has to guess the song. All right, so you know the rule of the game, simple game, but not so simple for, for me. <laughs> the vocal cords, oh my God, I danced. <laughs> All right, so I'm Alex, oh. you're going to use your vocal cord first. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I don't know the words, but I say that's too late. Nothing in my Got brain. nothing in Taylor my Taylor Swift, shake it off, shake it off. I say that's too late. Nothing in my brain. Nothing in my Taylor brain. Swift. Yeah. Oh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you for not making me sing. All right, so it's my turn. I don't even know this song. What? Wow! That's really good. That's really good. No, so yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've created on a few of Nyak uh, son uh, created dance on some of his music. So. Wow! Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, cái gì đó mấy năm mấy năm hai năm cái gì đó hỏi thăm sorry I just get the last đen vô đen vô mang cơm sorry, về nhà sorry. cho mẹ hay mưa hay mưa uh -huh, uh -huh. <cười> lên nhau I have no idea không một ai muốn đen cầu oh I'm, I don't know <cười> do you know the melody <cười> nhớ một người Trái tim tôi. No, I have never heard this song, so I can't even hum the melody. Okay, pass. Cái gì đó mấy năm? Mấy năm? Hai năm. Cái gì đó hỏi thăm. Sorry, I just get the last. Đen vô, đen vô. Mang cơm về nhà cho mẹ. Hay mưa, hay mưa. What song Sorry, is that? Sorry, Apple Nightly Show. Cái đó là bài nhạc... Nhạc Tết? Nhạc Tết? Nhạc Tết? I don't know. Nhạc Tết? Good songs. So now I'm going to skip Sorry, Justin T. <laughs> that was IFO Challenge. And ladies and gentlemen, we still have one more section before we go on to the next talk, and that is IFO On The Go. So enjoy IFO On The Go. We'll be right back. Welcome back to IFO On The Go and right now we're currently in building I of Hanoi Architecture University. Khang, could you tell us a little bit more about this building? Yeah, this is the building uh, of the main headquarter of Institute of International Training and Cooperation. Mm, I caught international right there. Yeah. So that means that you do foreign language or program of studies here? Uh, yes, the students uh, have the chance to experience the foreign Medi education <laughs> education methods. Mm -hmm. They can study English and even French in here. Yeah. Uh, this building is also a place where students can uh, study computer science. Interesting. So you have a lot of different majors in just this one building. Yes. 
And um, so when you mentioned that you have to study English or French, you would have international teachers here as well? Ah, uh, yes. We both have international teachers that practice um, Korean, uh, Japan. Mm. Very diverse. Yes. But then you also have like um, classes in English but was taught by Vietnamese teachers as well. Ah, uh, yes. We have both Vietnamese teacher and uh, English teacher. Mm, I see. These are different kinds of models that you have to do for your projects, I yes. suppose? Uh, in the, the project, mm -hmm. we have to uh, study the size and the shape of the models, mm -hmm. the house, so it's going to be fit perfectly into the site and also usable for a human. Mm. Um, so this is the uh, diagram. So we use uh, colors to split into uh, each uh, element. Like for example, the black is for the structure, while the gray is for the enclosure, mm -hmm. and the yellow line is for the circulations. So make sure that we all have air flowing through yes. and not suffocate inside the house. <laughs> yes, of course. And so do you have like a classroom specialized for just doing crafts and models like this? Uh, yes, we have a space for students mm -hmm. to practice, to um, use like connect uh, spaces in each building that they are working on so they can make a building in the models. Let, let's uh, try and see what, where you do your projects. Is. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, and right now we're currently at the studio, right? Yes. Uh, where we go from imagination to reality. Yeah. yeah. So how long does it usually take for a model <clears throat> to go from imagination to reality? It's going to take a very long time, but uh, the time that we use to finish these models depends on uh, each student, mm -hmm. uh, their efforts, how many efforts that they uh, give, mm -hmm. and then how many uh, energy drinks that they drink each night. <laughs> so usually uh, you, you do better at night when you do creative stuff? Uh, yes, is because it, it is the most quiet uh, time of mm -hmm. the day. Really focus. Yeah, really and focus. Just really concentrate on what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Um, do you usually work on this by yourself, or is it like a team project? How does that usually work? Uh, in the first year, mm -hmm. we're gonna do it in a groups, mm -hmm. so we can help each other to analyze, and then uh, later on, we're gonna split and then do it on ourselves. I see. So by the end of uh, your studies here, you would have to have a model, a project for yourselves in order to graduate? Yes, for each project. Let me see. And right around here I see there are many, many layouts that are on the walls. Could you tell us a little bit more about these? Uh, these layouts that the student made are to uh, express their ideas, their mm -hmm. concept from the beginning to the end to show like everything that they have worked and present it to the teachers and watchers. And I do notice that some of these are in English. Yes. How important is it, would you say, to be able to be really fluent in English for architecture? Uh, I think it's very important. English is the key role in architect. Having another language on hand gives way too many opportunities. I can imagine that I will have more chances to uh, take part in foreign projects. Indeed. Uh, it's going to help me to improve myself mm -hmm. and also contribute to my goals in the future, which is finishing my master degrees in the UK. Oh, that is so exciting. And I, I have nothing but uh, the best wishes for you in order to get there. And I, I do believe that you will do well and you will get it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I, I also think that English is key not only to architect, but everything in life, because it is another language that gives us so many opportunity like Hank said, to broaden our horizon and study and just, you know, be out there and approach more knowledge. Yes. And that was it. Today we've learned a lot about Hanoi Architecture University. Thank you, Hank, so much for being such an incredible and lovely tour guide. That's it for IFO on the go today. We'll be back to you in the studio. We'll see ya. Next on IFO Nightly Show. Where we're going to discover the past with Anh Alexander Tu. Coming to Vietnam when things flipped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, all the time, but you know.
show that Asians were dancing hip hop, uh, and it wasn't just you know, other minorities. That was Ivo on the go, and welcome back to talk number three, where we're going to discover the past with Aing Alexander too. So I. The past was so long ago. The past. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of youthfulness here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now you you did a lot of things. You studied a lot of things. You went the traditional route, you know, that that an Asian parent or a Vietnamese parent would like, and that yeah. is you went to university and yeah. then you did your postgraduate program. Right. Tell us a little bit about your education history and why you chose that path instead uh, of full dance. Yeah, okay. So, um, so quickly in my educational background, so I went to the University of California, Irvine. I got my psychology degree, uh, my bachelor's degree in psychology. And then after that, I, made it, uh, I got into a medical university called Loma Linda University where I studied um, occupational therapy. Uh, and then later, when I came back to Vietnam, I got my doctorate. Um, and so I got my doctorate in occupational therapy, and one of the main reasons why I decided to get my doctorate was, uh, one, um, I knew that this path was for my parents. Both my aunt, it was very Vietnamese, traditional parents, well, uh, they, they knew that, you know, when you go into the health, health industry, you are going to be financially stable. And I think as immigrants, or immigrants coming to the, the States, um, they knew that, you know, they knew that that was going to be something where you can live comfortably and you can live with a life that you want mm -hmm. um, because they're, you know, they're immigrants. They had to come over and they, the time that, uh, you know, the first several years of their life was a struggle, you know, and they didn't want their child to struggle through that. And so that, that's why they always meant health, 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 uh, and especially medical doctor, medical doctor, medical doctor. Um, for me, I felt like medical doctor probably wasn't my thing, even though I know that in the medical system that was probably like, you know, the medical doctor is the top, in that system, they're the, you know, they're the top. Um, I chose a, a field where it's related to movement, and it's related to something that I like, because I like to move, um, uh, related to dance. And so I chose occupational therapy, uh, which was, has that kind of creativity in it uh, compared to physical therapy. And so that's why I chose occupational therapy. Um, and then why did I not go full dance? Um, because dance to me was, I, I, it, it, so literally was a passion, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a passion that I wanted to nourish it and to allow it to grow. So, you know, as when I was with my, my group of friends, my crew in high school, you know, we wanted to like build ourselves so that we can go in battle and dance battle, you know, um, and then, and then when I, you know, learned about choreography dancing, the moment I learned about it, I was like, wow, this is, it's a different way of moving, and it's still related to dance, and I incorporated break dancing in it, so it was just like very wow to me, you know, so you kept like wanting to nourish, you kept wanting that like, it was almost like a drug, like, oh wow, I can do this, let's like learn how to do the next one, mm -hmm. you know, at, like faster or better. Um, and then when we, we made it onto America's Best Dance Crew, that like, that opened the door for our community, you know, our community was doing it for several years, but finally, like, this platform showed that Asians were dancing hip-hop, uh, and it wasn't just, you know, other minorities. And, you know, Asians were doing it at a very high level, and it was very creative, because it was something the rest of the U.S. wasn't doing. Uh, and so that took us to, like, a lot of opportunities. But I was still doing it for a passion, you know? And then I led a professional dance company, uh, so it was, like, alumni of that dance company from the university, and we were doing it together as a passion, but still doing it at a very high level because I had a lot of members that wanted to go into the entertainment industry as a dancer, dancing for like J Lo, Ariana Grande, uh, Justin Timberlake. So, like, even though it was a passion for me, but all of us are doing it at very, like, a level that was like, you know, very high, and and so it's just still a passion. And for me, it wasn't about money; it was to be able to, and and like something that like kind of you know sparked your life. So your life force to like do something that like um, is always challenging. I mean, I chose dance and dance, what I want to share with everyone is that I wish my passion was something else because dance requires so much, you know, like physically, like it's, you know, like every time you, a three minute performance requires like how many weeks of training, you know, and every day like three, four hours of training, seven days a week, 
for three minutes on stage. So yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, I, it was just a passion. And then until coming to Vietnam, when things flipped, so the passion became more of a, I guess a career. Uh, I, I would say more something like I focused on more. Uh, and then the therapy side kind of uh, became more the passion. So now I still, like uh, I just shared recent, recently with you, is uh, the very first cohort of occupational therapy students at the Medical University Hai Zung. Um, I was able to teach them. And so like now like um, I'm interested in like learning about, like so my, now my, my pastime is to learn about, continue learning about the health, how the body moves, my muscle, my muscle development and all that stuff. And then like most of my time is about dance. Mm -hmm. So everything just kind of took a flip. Um, but the thing about the both is um, they're all related to movement. And I think that's why whether like it flips back and forth, it doesn't matter to me because I enjoy moving. Mm -hmm. And I think moving provides you a lot of meaning in life. What's your advice, I guess, you know, now that you're here and you've experienced all of this, what's your advice to your 15, 16 year old self? And what's your advice to the current 15, 16 year olds who is like, oh, I don't know what I want to study. I like everything or I don't like a lot of things, you know. So a lot of questions in that question. Yeah, no, yeah, great question. Um, my 15 year old self, wow. Uh, I felt like when I was 15, I was, um, I think I'm like most, I would hope to say I'm like most 15 year olds where you're still not sure what you're doing. Besides dancing, uh, I also love playing basketball. Uh, I snowboarded. Um, I was into several other things. Yeah, but for 15 year olds now, I say just allow yourself to explore many things. Don't, don't feel pressure that you have to know what is how you're setting your life. Uh, just know that things that you explore and things that you're going to do, uh, learn from what it is that you want to try and learn how it builds you internally. Mm. Uh, allows you to like develop your mind, like calmness and stillness. So do explore. I, I would say don't sit around, you know, at 15, I, I, you know, a lot of times you just want to hang out with your friends, right? <laughs> Which is, a, it's, it's good, you know, you have to socialize. So that's also ways for you to develop. Um, but do other things, uh, not just, you know, don't, Café, nên đi café. You just drink café cả ngày, right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess so. for the 15 year old, it's nên đi trà sữa. Trà sữa, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, trà sữa, yeah. No, no trà sữa all the time, but you know, like once in a while trà sữa, and then like explore other things, you know, like because that's, you want to develop yourself and you want to be well rounded. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lesson that, you know, the, fi the current 15, 16 year olds in Vietnam can, can learn from you as well. Is, you know, when, when you studied what you studied, part of it is also to do, to do it for your parents. Yeah. And while you still continue to feed your passion, yeah. right? Um, and, and I think, you know, even as a 15, 16 year old, as, you know, this, the youth is exploring, mm -hmm. um, they are balancing different needs and desires yeah. of their families, right? Yeah, right. And, and from your story, what I could see is, you know, you, you balanced it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I tried. I tried. Um, yeah, I, you know, I agree with you 100%. I don't think students, uh, uh, 15, 16 year olds, or anyone really should uh, feel the pressure that you can only pick one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think life's too short to only be one. I know there's a quote of like uh, a master of one or something of uh, none. Jack of all trades, Jack of, master of none, right? Right, that. that. You know, I, and I, I get it. I know, like, if you are like, engulf yourself in one kind of topic, mm -hmm. then you, you really understand it, which is good. Mm -hmm. But you should also know that you know, life, there's so much more to life than just that one thing. Mm -hmm. So just be mindful and open mm -hmm. to it all. Mm -hmm. uh, just don't put so much pressure on yourself to like that, oh, I just chose this and that's the only thing I'm gonna do the rest of my life because I think life is more than that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, and Alex, thank you so much for the yeah. chat today. So, and Alex, as we close the show today, what's your final word to our audience? Uh, well, firstly, thank you, uh, Phoebe, for all your wonderful questions. Uh, IFO Nightly Show, thank you for having me. And to all your IFO Nightly Show audience, um, just live life. Uh, I know there's a lot of pressure everywhere. Um, as a parent now, I, I would say, you know, uh, be appreciative and be grateful for all the things that your parents is trying to lay for you. Um, but also know that you have a life to live as well. So be grateful and appreciative, but at the same time, make sure that you fulfill the things that you want to do in life and don't waste it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that, you know, that statement from, your, from you and don't waste your life, spend time 
properly spend time to do things, always be in constant motion, be busy, right? At any age. Um, and, and I think that's a fantastic statement yeah. to close the show today. So IFO Nightly Show audience, season eight. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Challenge. You're so smooth. Oh my god. Thank no you. script. Fisherman. Mang tin vietjame. Mang tin vietjame. Dung mang yu vietjame.